Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Project Support Officer at the Sainsbury Institute and a researcher of Japanese war heritage. This week we are joined by Eric Brunner, Professor of Social and Biological Epidemiology at University College London, to discuss health and inequality in post-growth Japan, examining the relationship between health and wealth, and what we can learn from the high standard of health equality in Japan, where the economy hasn't seen major growth in almost 20 years. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, Eric. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. First off, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Uh, can you tell us about your fields and how your interests have brought you there? Well, my first degree was in chemistry, inspired, I think, quite considerably by my chemistry teacher at school. I discovered that I was very interested in, in biochemistry. So I did, I did a master's in biochemistry, which took me in the direction of biomedicine and health. I did, I did some research jobs. For example, I worked at St. Mary's in Paddington, um, on diabetes in pregnancy. And then later on, I decided that I wanted to study health inequalities. And I did a PhD uh, with Michael Marmot at UCL working on a big cohort study called the Whitehall 2 study. And that was back in 1994. Um, and... Um, so my, my career has been exceedingly boring in that I just made various transitions from, uh, from researcher to postdoc to senior lecturer to reader and then to professor. And in order to spice it up, and partly because Michael Marmot himself did his PhD research at Berkeley studying the health of Japanese migrants to the San Francisco Bay Area. It seemed to me to be appropriate and, and also fascinating to have the chance to do a sabbatical in Japan. So I did a little research and uh, talked to a couple of Japanese people in our uh, work network and ended up going to work for Professor Iso who is head of the Department of Social Medicine at Osaka University in 2008. And um, interestingly, um, the day I left um, London, the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy was filed. And when I arrived in Osaka the following day and tried to withdraw money from, uh, from, a, from a cash machine, I discovered that the exchange rate suddenly plummeted. And of course, this was due to the fact that the Japanese currency was resilient in the face of the financial crisis. In terms of my thinking, um, I'm very much a rationalist. Science is interesting and useful. But in addition to that, social values are crucial as a framework for science to develop along the right lines. Of course, what that means is in terms of funding priorities, and, and um, this is exceedingly true in the context of public health. And of course, social epidemiology is the scientific underpinning for public health. My father was a refugee from the Nazis, and that family history has, has, has had um, a strong impact on my thinking in terms of values, in terms of social justice and fairness and inequality, and specifically the scientific underpinning of Nazism, um, which is eugenics. And that takes us to issues about race, intelligence, and we can see um, that playing out uh, through Trumpism, that what Trump is doing is, is playing the white racist card. And we can see there that the enduring effects of the American Civil War are still 
rippling through America today. And indeed, I have some difficult conversations with my colleagues who still use this idea of race in, in the discourse. And in a way, we can't, we can't escape from it because it's in common use in America. And the assumption is that there is a biological basis to the idea of races, but in fact, there is none. So it's these sorts of issues which animate me and which I think I will never cease to, to think about. Yeah, and we'll be exploring some of those uh, throughout this podcast. Um, I just wanted to say that in my experience, it's quite rare for epidemiologists and scholars of Japanese studies to cross paths. Could you explain what it is about Japan that interests you as an epidemiologist and what insights a Japanese focus has provided for your field? Yes, that's a, that's a, a good question. And I think the single concept is, is life expectancy, because... What happened in Japan in the post-war period is that um, over the decades in the second part of the 20th century, life expectancy increased by 2.5 years plus per decade. Not that different to what was going on in the West, but um, starting from a lower base because Japan was a pretty poor country, but, you know, its period of militarism the beginning of the 20th century meant that the, the masses remained impoverished, but everything changed after the Second World War and they eradicated infectious diseases um, by about 1960, you know, TB, for example. And then they started eradicating the, the non-communicable diseases like stroke. And they did so using scientific principles, recognizing blood pressure was a major factor um, and that salt, eating salt was, a, was one of the key causes. So modernization meant they could switch from salt preservation to refrigeration for preserving the food. And that had massive effects on the, on the health of the population. In terms of social and cultural factors, so much is fascinating. The social cohesion, horizontal and vertical, um, the social psychology of the Japanese, so different from the West. And um, one of its key manifestations is in well, relation to well-being. Um, the um, the, the um, health... Uh, anthropologists, health psychologists, have studied the, uh, uh, the Japanese um, conception of well-being, and it is quite clear that there is a much um, increased element of social um, or relationship um, dimension in in the idea of well-being which goes beyond the individual conception of well-being which is articulated um, by people in Europe and America when they talk about their sense of well-being so for example we might say I feel great because I've been nominated as um, a highly cited researcher so you you emphasize your own achievement. A Japanese person would say, um, we um, have been recognized as a high, highly cited research team and we have wor worked very successfully together to increase um, the impact of our work. Um, there, there is, of course, a downside to Japanese culture and that is embodied in that idea about, um, or parable, which is about um, banging down the nail, that, that standing up, mm. the idea that individuality is somewhat suspect um, and, and that the, um, you know, the, the notion of harmony um, is sort of paramount. And, that, and the danger there is that, uh, as, as of course all 
all the listeners will will be aware is that uh, to some extent that suppresses uh, creativity and original thinking. In your new book, Eric, uh, Health in Japan, Social Epidemiology of Japan since the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, you have pointed to Japan's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic as an example of the high level of equal care available in Japan in spite of its recent economic slowdown. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic, it was predicted by international media that Japan was a tinderbox for COVID, yet to date less than 2,000 have died because of it in Japan. For comparison, this is the weekly death toll in the UK at the time of recording, with a total of almost 64,000 killed by COVID. How does an epidemiological approach explain this stark difference between two leading world economies? Yeah, that, that's a, a, a really extraordinary observation, isn't it? That, um, you know, two rich island nations can have such a different trajectory in terms of their pandemics. And if we take it in sort of chronological order, I guess the first point is that Japan and certainly the East Asian region have recent historical experience of um, epidemics, the, the SARS epidemic of 2003, and then more recently, the MERS epidemic, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which was about five years ago. And Japan itself um, did not really have much of a problem, but of course, the, the, the the, in the region, Hong Kong, um, Korea, um, our, our neighbouring countries, and there was very much a sense in Japan that a public health system um, was an important um, organisational element which needed to be maintained. In contrast, there's not really been a major epidemic outbreak since the Spanish flu epidemic after the First World War. And in the reorganization of the NHS in 2013 by the coalition government, the public health system was basically whacked on the head. Directors of public health were placed in local government, which wasn't such a bad idea. In fact, is a return to a system that used to exist in the middle of the 20th century. But they were very much under-resourced, and there was very much um, um, a sense that, um, well, we really didn't need to worry, although perhaps there would be a flu epidemic. Um, so in the UK, we were very ill-prepared. And in contrast to Germany, we didn't have much of... Um, uh, an infrastructure which allowed us to do epidemic testing. So in Japan, when um, when that when when the busload of Chinese tourists came along, um, there were, there was a scramble to contain the outbreak, and the Diamond Princess, which Dr. Yokohama was placed into quarantine. Nobody could nobody could get off. Um, so we can see that the Japanese very much had a strategic response to the epidemic, which was to contain it. They did, in fact, lose control of the epidemic in Japan. They were not, they were not able to keep track of all um, the cases and all their contacts. But um, the Japanese tend to follow guidelines in terms of proximity, social distancing, and of course the pre-existing um, wearing of face masks, that, that, that cultural habit uh, was already there. So those, so those things seem to be the main reason why the epidemic had such a different um, trajectory. In terms of healthcare, um, it seems that there, there are um, accounts of the fact that the case fatality rate for severe cases of COVID was considerably lower in Japan 
um, than it was in the UK. And I, I don't know what to make of that because I'm not sure that Japanese doctors are more, more skilled than European doctors um, or that they have access to different technologies. But that is the story um, which um, is circulating in Japan, that the healthcare system was better at pre preventing fatalities. Mm, yeah, certainly a lot of factors to consider. Now, Japan's economic slowdown over the last 20 years would suggest a decline in standard of living, yet you've argued that Japan has defied this notion. Uh, what impact do you believe this should have in shaping health and economic policy in other nations? Thank you, yes. Um, two key health indicators, the mortality rate trend and um, well-being measured by the uh, co comprehensive survey of living conditions um, support the idea that through the economic slowdown in the 90s and, and thereafter that um, the mortality rate continued to go down more or less as it had been doing um, back in back in the 70s and 80s so a continuing improvement in life expectancy and that after 2010 that um, the impact of, of the financial crisis which caused a stalling of improvement in population health particularly in anglo-saxon countries um, was not observed in japan in terms of well-being amazingly this huge survey series with um, more than 600,000 people giving their reports of how they feel about their health suggested not only that levels of well-being did not really change, but also that um, inequality in well-being according to income, because what we see generally is a, is a direct association, the higher the income, the more the larger the proportion of people reporting well-being, that, that, that level of inequality did not increase between 1992 and 2013. So I think, I think it's, it's difficult. I can't um, prove to you what the explanation is, but my, my observation is to link it with the concept of well-being, for example, that the Japanese view of life is that, um, to put it crudely, shit will happen. In other words, that um, one's, one's expectations of life are that um, there will be ups and downs. Um, some people might see this as being fatalism, but I think it would be better to conceptualize it in terms of the fact that the Japanese have more of a sense of equanimity, a sense that things will go bad, but they will get better. And if things are going well, then they know perfectly well that um, there may be some trouble ahead. So the idea that the economy in Japan um, was, was, was kind of staggering along, stagnating, um, was not something that shook Japanese society to a considerable extent. There were lots of attempts to try to, to kickstart the economy, Arbonomics, uh, I'm sure people talked about it a lot. Um, and even if people were worried about the economy, it, it didn't impinge on the key determinants of health, whether those were the subjective feeling of well-being or indeed um, the, the, the rates of mortality. So life continued and life continued pretty well. What we can learn from, <coughs> from that in the West is that I think this, is, this lies at the foot of the uh, media and, and politicians – 
is that we must avoid uh, catastrophizing. We must avoid the idea that um, we've got to pull out every stop in order to um, regain the position of economic growth. This relates, I think, very closely to the recovery from the COVID epidemic, that we have, we have these camps of politicians and journalists and so on who, who are saying, um, you know, we need, we need to, stop, um, to stop the drain on the public finances. We need to get the books back into balance and so on and so forth. We, we are dealing with um, a, a COVID era where we need to think in the long term, we need to think about equally or more important social priorities, which is decarbonizing the economy and not think that we need to struggle for economic growth at all costs because the Japanese example shows us that we can still have good physical and psychological health if we as a nation or as a society make that our intention. I see. And is there a historical precedence of these epidemiological findings influencing national policy? Nothing comes immediately to mind. I mean, I, I suppose I think back to the Spanish flu epidemic, you know, in 1919, it must have been a catastrophic social period in terms of the, the, the you know the, the deaths, the loss of all those young men in, in in the First World War, followed then by the flu, and yet um, the twenties were a remarkably buoyant period socially and economically until until the crash. So what we can see is that social resilience. Um, is pretty strong. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question, but, but those are the thoughts that come to mind. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess I was wondering, because it seems like epidemiology is probably one of the most direct fields in suggesting what needs to happen to make positive social change. And I was just wondering, that does this influence politics in any way well this perhaps it is your reflection on the fact that administrations in the uk have tended to be dominated by people who've got a background in um in humanities it does seem that epidemiology specifically and science in general is in the ascendant and if the vaccine comes comes about, then in a way the position of science as a as a guiding um, guiding principle may may be reinforced in in our society, and um, perhaps that would be a rebalancing of the culture of um, our political economy that that, um, that we do. Uh, we do need to pay attention um, to, as it were, the, the you know the environment and climate science is um, banging on our door and saying act now or suffer the consequences. Um, and we can see again in its, in its worst manifestation that Trump. Um, is able to, to show that the alternative to incorporating science into policy making is, is um, a kind of barbarity um, which denies the manifest truth in the, in the interests of um, small sections um, of business and industry. To so take the conversation back to Japan, um Studies link Japanese longevity to various reasons, from the nation's diet to cultural attitudes towards health uh, to genetics. 
Put simply, are the factors towards Japan's equality in health and well-being elements which can be easily adopted in other nations, even if we recognize that economy isn't everything in regards to health? Yeah, that, that's a that's a, a great question, and you know one one of one of the factors in Japan um, that everyone knows about is the fish, and it what what's what's clear, um, and it's and it's reinforced if if anyone's been to the Tsukiji or another fish market in in Japan, is that um, uh, the the Japanese. Interestingly, you have quite an exploitative attitude with respect to the environment. They believe that they can eat anything and everything, um, and that in a way that's that's their right. Um, so, for example, way, eating whales. Um, somebody said to me uh, in southern Japan that you know what was so. Surprising about the fact that the Japanese like eating whales. They've been doing it for a long time. Is it any different from the Australians eating kangaroos? Uh, which was um, a, a point which I found it very difficult to respond to. But there are some very positive things about the Japanese diet. One is that it's um, not very industrialised in a sense, I mean, you go into a supermarket and there are thousands and thousands of processed foods, but the basic idea underlying the Japanese diet is that, that you eat rice um, rather than wheat, you eat rice that you've cooked yourself, um, and the, that you eat vegetables. Another important element is the fact that uh, there is a, an attitude of modesty to the quantity of food that you eat. And the saying is, um, eat till you're 80% full. And that's certainly um, an idea which might help us in the West to combat um, the, the epidemic of overweight and obesity. Um, so... We, we, aren't, we aren't going to be able to follow the Japanese in terms of eating vast amounts of fish, even if we wanted to, because the fish are no longer swimming in the sea. But what we can do is we can um, very much try to adopt that idea of modesty and in relation to our diet. And I think that the social dimension of Japanese eating um, is terrific as well because it is an incredibly important aspect of Japanese culture that people share food together, laugh together, talk together, um, drink together modestly. 50% of Japanese don't drink alcohol. Um, this is a far higher proportion um, than in the West. Um, so I think modesty is important. Other, other aspects of health is that they, because they don't eat so much red meat and have a lower cholesterol, the Japanese are also very health conscious and go to their public health center and do their um, cardiovascular checkups. And so that there, is a, there is a sense that the Japanese value health um, in a way which seems um, to be much more effective than in the West. And I think we can learn by, by seeing what they do and to try gently to translate some of those ideas uh, to Britain and other, other Western countries. So you've touched upon the diet and cultural attitudes towards health, but we mentioned earlier, we we're talking about notions of genetics and to go back to your point about uh, how 50% of Japanese don't drink. It was mentioned in the book launch that um, most Japanese have a gene, which means they have a low tolerance to alcohol. We discussed Nazism and how eugenics came from there. Um, what was, what was very central to their policies and there's been a great shying away from 
eugenics since then, but how does this reconcile? How do genes affect the health of a nation? Um, I, had, I had a look at this when I was writing the um, introductory chapter to the book, and there is really very little evidence for genetic differences apart from the alcohol enzyme. And um, I wouldn't like people to get the idea who are not familiar with Japan um, that there aren't a lot of people in Japan who do drink. And indeed, even, even some of the people who do have this low tolerance variant of the alcohol the hydrogenase enzyme um, will drink, and um, uh, those people um, can often be found um, lying lying on the ground, perhaps in a railway station in downtown Osaka um, <laughs> after they've been out on a on a session, and and um, uh, they they do li- they do literally get paralytic, so. Um, um, the, the, this, this low tolerance variant is no absolute um, impediment um, to binge drinking. You can, you can push on through it. But in terms, of, in terms of, of other genes, there did seem to be a suggestion um, of um, some gene variants that um, protected women from breast cancer in Japan. Um, but as um, Yuri Ito told us yesterday, um, rates of breast cancer do seem to be increasing in Japan. And that's probably to do with nulliparity, the fact that lots of women are not having children or having only one child later in life. So there's, there are um, biological but not inherited influences which... Um, come into play as well. There really doesn't seem to be much evidence as yet that the Japanese have some uh, special genetic propensity to to longevity. Well, it's good to know that uh, eugenics is still discredited then in modern science. Um, Thank you for answering those questions so far, Eric. I have one last question for you. Um, We can see that there is a need for change in our, our attitudes towards the connections between wealth and health, what changes do you believe need to be made on an individual, national, and international level to support this? Well, I think I think Richard Wilkinson had a strong take on this, and that is that in societies which have massive income inequalities, there is a lack of social cohesion. The problem with the lack of social cohesion is that we then have to think very carefully about how we bring up our children, how we give them the skills and the opportunities to make good in society. And I think what Japan shows us is that the winner-takes-all society, which is epitomized by America, um, is not healthy at the population level. Their health is not nearly as good as the Japanese and the Japanese themselves individually, in a sense, you know, don't have to be preoccupied or stressed by things like health insurance, by the need to get a highly paid job and so on, because the, you know, the default position certainly during the Saruman period, was that um, you probably were going to be okay. Now, beneath that, of course, there, there were a multitude of sins, and one of those is gender inequality. And recently, the labor market in Japan has turned towards a more gig economy style of operation. And this, and this is... Um, not a good thing. It means it means that younger people in Japan are in danger of feeling alienated. It means that um, they're not making the contribution to society uh, which they could be doing. And I guess what's what springs to mind here is 
um, the work of um, uh, Martin Jake. So in his, in his very nice book called When China Rules the World, there is a great chapter on Japanese culture. And he made an argument which is, in a way, in the form of a, hy a hypothesis, which I think is very interesting. And that is that after the Second World War, the Japanese made a collective decision that they were going to, first of all, change Japan, and they were going to show the rest of the world how good they were at building a, a rich country. That was achieved in the 80s of Japanese uh, gross national income per person momentarily exceeded that in America. So Martin Jake then says that after they'd achieved that collective post-war objective, that Japan, to some extent, lost its way. And whether this is true or not, perhaps you and your colleagues um, have, have some thoughts about that. But I think translating this to the international level, what it shows is that a national purpose that involves um, a focus on health and well-being can be a thoroughly positive way of thinking about social purpose. I'm not saying that that's what Japan does, but certainly it suggests that it is possible. Oh, thank you, Eric. It's certainly been an enlightening episode. Good. You can find the link to Eric's research profile and the new book he has co-authored, Health in Japan, Social Epidemiology of Japan Since the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, in the description below. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Marta Fanasca, researcher of Japanese and gender studies at the University of Manchester, to discuss gender in Japan through dancehall cross-dressing escort services. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.